Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this inspiring TED Talks HCI podcast episode, I explore Chie Hyung's recent TED Talk, Confessions of a Recovering Micromanager. Welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. It's great to be with you again today for this inspiring TED Talks HCI podcast episode. Today I'll be exploring Che Huang's recent TED Talk, Confessions of a Recovering Micromanager. Think about the most tired you've ever been at work. It probably wasn't when you stayed late or came home from a road trip. Chances are it was when you had someone looking over your shoulder, watching you each and every move. If we know that micromanagement isn't really effective, why do we do it? Asks entrepreneur Trey Huang. In a funny talk packed with wisdom and humility, Huang shares the cure for micromanagement madness and how to foster innovation and happiness at work. Thanks for joining me, and I'll catch you on the flip side of this first clip. What I'm really here to do today is talk to you about micromanagement and what I learned about micromanagement by being a micromanager over the last few years of my life. But first off, what is micromanagement? How do we we really define it? Well, I posit that it's actually taking great, wonderful, imaginative people like all of you, bringing them in into an organization, and then crushing their souls by telling them (laughs) what font size to use, you know? And so, in the history of mankind, has anyone ever said this? John? We were never going to close that deal with Times New Roman. But because you insisted on Helvetica, bam, (laughs) dotted line, millions of dollars start to flow. That was the missing piece. No one's ever said that, right? There's actually physical manifestations that we probably see in ourselves by being micromanaged. Think about some of the most tired you've ever been in your life, right? It probably wasn't when you stayed the latest at work, or it wasn't when you came home from a road trip. It was probably when you had someone looking over your shoulder, watching your each and every move. Kind of like my mother-in-law when she's over, right? So, you know, I'm like, I got this, you know? I love how he starts us off by defining micromanagement in his terms as crushing the soul of creative people as you bring them in and then just really manage the heck out of them to the point where there's no creativity, no autonomy. They feel like you're looking over their shoulder, you're looking over their shoulder constantly. And ultimately you suck all the joy, the fun, the passion, the fulfillment, everything out of the job. Uh, Everything that they bring to the table no longer matters because you are controlling them. We've all been there. We've all experienced micromanagement and had those crummy bosses who are micromanagers. It's not effective. Everyone knows it's not effective, yet it's pervasive. It's a super common problem. And in fact, I would say most leaders haven't been able to kick this habit. It's actually the rare leader who's able to not get into the weeds and micromanage uh, the people who are doing the work. We need to be able to set the vision. We need to be able to help connect purpose. We need to develop our people. We need to show them the direction. Uh, but ultimately, we need to get then get out of their way and let them bring their expertise to bear and let them be creative and, and exercise their own personal autonomy so that they can gain fulfillment out of the work that they do. It Nothing I just said is rocket science. People have been talking about this for years. There's so much research that backs everything up that I was just saying and that he's saying, yet it persists. And so he's going to get into this a little bit more. He's going to share some of his own personal examples. Uh, he'll also share a little bit of research. and We'll get into that into the upcoming clips. There's actually data to support this. So there was a recent study in the UK. They took 100 hospital employees, 
put an activity tracker on them, and then let them go about their next 12-hour shift all alone, just a regular 12-hour shift. At the end of the shift, they asked them, "Do you feel fatigued?" And what they found was actually really interesting. So it wasn't necessarily the people who moved the most that felt the most fatigued, but it was the folks that didn't have control over their jobs. I love the study he cites here because it really is illustrative of the problem of micromanagement. So you you take these hospital workers, you track them, and you see how drained they are, how much uh, how how uh, much energy they've expended, and how tired they are by the end of their shift. These people are working 12-hour shifts. Of course, it's it's an exhausting kind of a profession. It's an an exhausting work environment. Yet what they consistently find is not necessarily the length of the shift, not necessarily the amount of move uh, throughout the shift.、Uh, that those things didn't really matter or correlate or even cause the Fatigue, the exhaustion. What caused、uh, people being so tired at the end of their shift is when they had no autonomy, when they had little to no flexibility, and when they had people looking over their backs, telling them how to do every last little piece of the work that they were trying to do. When they had very little ability to to show their creativity and to、uh, have that show up in their work, they weren't able to just be genuine, authentic,、uh, their own personal selves, and bring that to work, and then. Uh, utilize their creativity, their insights, their expertise to problem solve and to come up with solutions to deal with their patients and and with the people they were interfacing with. Again, th- I mean, this sounds like、uh, s- something that's so obvious, yet this study shows it. It demonstrates it empirically, and there are many, many other studies that show the exact same thing. I've done a lot of research in this area myself in terms of employee productivity, engagement, and the things that you might think of that would really matter in terms of people really feeling good and passionate about their work and engaged in their work, and whether or not they're fatigued.、Uh, the things that you think w- would matter most often aren't the case. It, it comes down to autonomy. It comes down to meaning and purpose, and the ability to to be creative in your job. And that's what they want and need to do. That's what everyone wants and needs. To do when they go to work. The worst job I've ever had was,、um, well, actually I've had several like this, but I'm thinking of one in particular. The worst job I ever had is one where it was just so rote, it was so mundane. There was very little autonomy or flexibility. I had people monitoring monitoring me constantly, like literally every second of the day, I'm being monitored and tracked. And man, it it, it really is exhausting. It's draining because you just know. That any little misstep could could result in someone coming and talking to you, and and not that you don't want to learn, not that you want to, don't want to grow and develop, but they're not approaching it in a way of real development. They're approaching it in a way of conformity and just trying to get everyone to do the same thing.、Uh, ultimately, that's not going to drive innovation. It's not going to drive creativity. It's certainly not going to help people feel fulfilled in their work and find meaning and purpose in the work that they do. So, if we know that micromanagement isn't really effective, why do we do it? So, is it that the definition is wrong? So, I posited that you know micromanagement is just bringing in great, wonderful, imaginative people and then crushing their souls. So, is it that we actually want to hire deep down inside of us dull and unimaginative people? I don't know. It's one of those questions you probably don't even need to ask, right? It's like, do you want to get your luggage stolen at the airport? It's like, probably not. But I've never been asked, right? So, has anyone ever asked you as a manager? Like, do you want to hire dull and unimaginative people? So I don't know. This is Ted. We better back it up with data. So we actually asked hundreds of people around the country, hundreds of managers across the country, do you want to hire dull and unimaginative people? It's like, all right, it's an interesting question. Well, interesting results as well. So 94 percent said no. We don't want to hire dull and unimaginative people, right? Six percent probably didn't understand the question, but. <laughs> <laughs> but bless their hearts, maybe they do just want to hire dull and unimaginative people. But 94% said they did not. And so, why do we do this still then? Well, I posit that it's something really, really simple that all of us deep down inside know and have actually felt. So, why do we do it when all of the evidence shows the negative impacts of micromanaging? In all of our personal experiences, I don't know anyone who likes to be micromanaged, and we've all had those bosses. We've all been there, and frankly. You know, most leaders don't like micromanaging. Like, it, it's not a fun way to manage or to lead people, and it's it's more work consistently each and every day to be muddling in the mud with with all the details of everyone else's jobs instead of leaning on their expertise and delegating and and handing over a little bit of power 
and uh, authority for them to make some decisions and, and exercise autonomy. It's it's exhausting. That's an exhausting way to be a leader, and it's it's not effective. We all know this, so why do we continue to do it? And he poses a really interesting question. Like, if we just flip it, now, if, if you're going to hire creative people to come into the organization and then just micromanage them, why are we bothering getting really creative, innovative, uh, self-driven people uh, when really we just want to bring them in and control them like little automaton robots? So he poses the question to hundreds of leaders across the country and asks, uh, would you rather just you know hire dull, uh, kind of non-thinking uh individuals who will just comply and who will just do what you tell them to do. And of course nobody wants to do that. They say 94% said, no, we don't want that. And who knows what that other 6% was thinking. Maybe they just really like power and control. Maybe they didn't understand the question. But ultimately, uh, people want the creativity. They want the innovation. They want people who are self-driven, who are self-starters, who can manage themselves. Yet we don't then allow them to do it once they get into the job. Why do we do that? Why do we set it up that way? And it comes back to control. It comes back to um, the the comfort level or lack thereof as we are giving up some of our power in how other people do the work and actually bring uh, the, the outcomes to bear for, for the team, for the organization. So we need to learn how to, to let go of that and to trust in our people and to ultimately empower them to exercise their autonomy and to bring their creativity to bear in their jobs. So when we get hired into an organization, it could be a club, it could be a, a law firm, it could be a, a school organization, it could be anything. No one ever jumps to the top of the totem pole, right? You start at the very bottom. Doing what? Doing work. You actually do the work, right? And if you're really good at doing the work, what do you get rewarded with? More work, right? And so you do, yeah, that's right, you know, you guys are all great micromanagers. Uh, so <laughs> you do more work, and then pretty soon, if you're really good at it, you do a little bit of work still, but actually you start to manage people doing the work. And if you're really good at that, what happens after that? you start managing the people who manage the people doing the work. And it's at that point in time you start to lose control over the output of your job. So it really is all about control. And I'm not saying that this is intentional. People aren't sitting around um, like devious little masterminds uh, wagging their fingers and thinking, hmm, I'm going to control everybody at work today. Um, I, I don't think people are thinking that. People are well-meaning and they, they want to uh, create a good work environment. But when the rub, you know, where the rubber meets the road, when you're actually you know, feeling responsible for the production of your team uh, and, and the work that they do, and you're not really doing the work yourself, that control, that loss of control, that can be really unnerving to people and can make people really uncomfortable. And frankly, they don't know what to do with that. And so it's kind of human nature that we end up devolving back into control tactics to control the work that is done and to tell people what to do because we feel we have this false sense that uh, that we actually can control it and that if we just control it tightly enough and tell everyone exactly how to do it and we of course know how to do it because we're successful and that's why we're managing them so they just need to do what we do and, and follow our lead and if we'll just tell them everything and, and be really prescriptive and then they'll be successful of course that doesn't work because everyone is different. Everyone has different talents and abilities. Everyone has different kinds of uh, insights and backgrounds. And ultimately, if you want people to connect with each other and with the customer, they need to be authentic and they need to be able to bring their own creativity to bear. And as good as the approach worked for you, it may not work for other people. So, so you need to let go of control. I get it. I get that that's hard. I get that that can be... Um, something that's that you really have to learn to to give up but until we can we're never going to tap the true full potential of our people and our teams are going to underperform and we're certainly never going to have very innovative organizations uh, while we have that tight control uh, that's just another term for micromanaging because we're controlling every aspect of the work that is done I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. 
Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. I've actually witnessed this firsthand. So I started a company called Box in Our Garage, and this was it. I know it doesn't seem like much, you know, but, uh, but it was, you know, it was pressure washing their back. This is living the dream. And, you know, my wife was really proud of me when we started this, or it's what she said, you know, she was really proud of me. And so she would give me a hug, and I'm pretty sure, like, she had her phone up, and she was thinking, oh, is John from Harvard still single? You know, it's kind of like a lemonade stand gone wrong in the beginning. But we actually went up and, you know, said mobile commerce is going to be big, and actually consumer packaged goods were going to change over time. So let's take these big bulky packs that you don't want to lug home. So not the two-pack of Oreo cookies, but the 24-pack, and not the 24-pack of toilet paper, but the 48-pack, and let's ship it to you, much like a warehouse club would do, except they wouldn't ship it to you. And so that's what we basically did. And so we had a really slow printer, and what we did was actually say, okay, this printer's taking forever, man. Like, okay, let's scribble something that would delight the customer on the back of these invoices. So we'd say, hey, you know, keep smiling, you know, hey, you know, like, you're awesome, or hey, enjoy the Doritos, or, you know, we love Gatorade too, stuff like that. And so uh, it started breaking up the monotony uh, of, of the job as well, because I was picking and packing all the boxes, and that's all you basically do for eight, nine, 10, 12 hours a day when you're sitting in the garage. Uh, and so an interesting thing happened. So we actually started to grow. Um, and so, you know, over the last, actually, just even 36 months after that, we ended up selling hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff, and we actually grew really, really quickly. But during that time, my role started to change too. So, uh, yes, I was a CEO in the garage. I was picking and packing, doing all the work. But then I actually graduated to actually, you know, managing the people who picked and packed. And then pretty soon I managed the people who managed the people picking and packing. And even now, I manage the C staff who manage the departments who manage the people who manage the people picking and packing. And it was at that point in time, I lost control. So I thought, okay, we were delighting all these customers uh, with these notes, right? They loved them. But I can't write these notes anymore. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell these folks how to write these notes. And so, what pen to use, what color to use, what you should write, what font you should use, don't mess up the margins, you know, this has to be this big, this has to be that big. And pretty soon, this goal of raising morale uh, by breaking up the monotony in the fulfillment center actually became micromanagement. And people started to complain to HR. It's like, dude, the CEO guy, he's got to get out of my hair, okay? I know how to write a damn note, okay? Um, So it was at that point in time, uh, we said, okay. You know, uh, we hired these great, wonderful people. Uh, let's give them the mission that's to delight the customer. Let's give them the tool to do so, and that's these notes. Have at it. And so what we found was actually pretty startling. So some folks actually took the notes and actually started drawing these really ornate, uh, like mini murals on them. Uh, you know, when folks ordered diapers, you'd get really fun notes like this. You know, say hi to the baby for us. And you know, the next size up. You know, if you bought a bigger size, they'd write, you know, um, growing up so fast. And so people really, really took to it. Um, but it was at that time that it also went off the rails a few times. And so we had someone just writing THX, THX all the time. And it's like, all right, dude, you know, like my boss used to write that to me. And so let's not write THX anymore. Um, But you also had interesting things on the other side. People got a little too creative. And so, like I said before, we sell everything in bulk, right? The big packs of diapers, big packs of toilet paper, the big packs of Doritos and Oreo cookies. Um, We also sell the big packs of contraception. And so, yeah, ooh, it's getting a little hairy. Um, (laughs) So so we sell the 40-pack of condoms, right? We're all adults in this room, you know, 40-pack of condoms. And so someone ordered four 
40 packs of condoms, and that's all they wrote, or all they, all they ordered. So 160 condoms, the packer was like, well, I know how to delight the customer, you know? <laughs> like, this, you know, like, this guy, this is, you know, this is what they wrote. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. we didn't know to fire him or to promote him, but he's still there. So everyone <laughs> loves an optimist, but here, <laughs> Here is where it went a little bit off the rails, and I felt a little bit uh, conflicted in all of this. And this, oh, there's a really bad typo. So, <laughs> if there was only a red TED on stage that I counted on being here, it wouldn't be a typo, right? Ah, uh, so uh, I promised you I had a really bad sense of humor, and now I'm gonna find that. So I told you, but I really was conflicted, right? So in this last clip, he's gone into a more lengthy example of Box, his company that started out of his garage, and he talks about uh, scaling that company. And and of course, you know they were they were really uh, fortunate to have a rapid growth. And so he goes from the point of where he's spending eight, ten, twelve hours a day, literally being the one boxing stuff up and shipping it off, and and he writes these little creative notes that they kind of become known for, and it becomes part of the culture. Uh, and, and make and delighting the customer, all of that's wonderful. Uh, but over time, as they scale, of course, he can't do it all himself. So he starts to hire a team of people to help. So now he's doing some of it himself, but he's also managing the team of people. And as they grow more and more, now he's you know he's the CEO, and now he's managing the people who are managing the people doing the work, and so on and so forth until the point where you know he's the CEO. He has C-suite executives who now run divisions who manage the people who manage the people who do the work. And as you continue on with the scaling, you get more and more disconnected from the actual work that's being done. And this is where people can really struggle with the control issue and the micromanaging. Uh, because, of course, when you have a, a diverse group of people, they're going to approach tasks in a different way. And as they, you know, the charge is to delight the customer, and so they're writing these little notes. And of course, some people are going to do things that perhaps you're not terribly pleased with. Uh, maybe they, they really kind of mess it up. They, they do something that's inappropriate. And so he shares those examples and the wrestle that they have within the organization of how they're going to handle it. Ultimately, that's something we always have to handle and deal with as we scale organizations and as we lose more and more control of the work that's being performed. So I really appreciate the example that he shared. At this point in time, we started doing things that actually weren't part of our core mission, and people started failing at it. And so, I thought, man, it's, should we let them fail? Should we continue to let them do this? I don't know. I, 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 I didn't know at that moment. But I thought this, is failure really that bad? I, I mean, I'm not saying we should celebrate failure. There's a lot of talk in Silicon Valley that says, let's celebrate failure. No, I, I don't know if we go all the way there, because like, you know, in our board meetings, like, our board members are never like, hey, Che, you failed last quarter. Keep doing that, buddy, okay? You know, like, no one's ever said that. If you're part of an organization like that, give me a call. I want to sit in on that meeting. <laughs> and so in private, I don't think many people celebrate failure, but actually failure, I posit, is actually pretty necessary for the folks truly in the long term, for the smart and imaginative people truly trying to fulfill the mission that you give them at hand. And so failure can actually be seen as a milestone along that mission towards success. And if so the downside of not micromanaging is potentially this perceived notion that you might fail more often, and if it's really not that bad, what is the upside? Well, we saw the upside, and it's pretty great. So we tasked our engineers and said, hey, you know, our, some of our fulfillment centers cost millions of dollars to build, there's miles and miles of conveyor, and so can you do the same thing? Can you make them efficient without spending millions of dollars? So they got to work. They actually did this. You know, it's not Photoshop. The guy's like really grinding. It's like they built an autonomous guided vehicle. We didn't tell them what to build, what format it needed to be. In 90 days, they produced the first prototype, powered off Tesla batteries, stereoscopic cameras, LiDAR systems. It basically replicates the efficiency of a conveyor belt without the actual capex of a conveyor belt. So it doesn't actually just stop with engineers. Our marketing team department, we told them, hey, you know, uh, get the word out, do the right thing. So we have this wonderful lady by the name of Natasha on the marketing team. She stopped me in the morning. She's like, Che, what are we doing about the pink tax? I went and got my coffee, and I, said, I sat down, and I said, OK, Natasha, what is this pink tax? And so she told me it's really interesting. So some of you might know that actually in 32 states across America, we actually charge a luxury good tax 
on women's products like feminine care products. So tampons and pads are taxed like luxury good items. So I would never dare call my wife, or if she called me and said, "Hey, hun, bring some pads on the way home," and I said, "Babe, you know." There's a trade war going on. The economy is not that good, so you know, no luxury goods this month. But next month, I promise, you know, I'll take a look at it. You know, I've been single pretty quickly, right?、Um, but what's what's super interesting is now we didn't tell them what to do, but now working with finance, they rebate the tax back to customers all around the country that we unfairly have to collect. Failure, while not to be necessarily celebrated. It needs to be properly framed as the opportunity to learn, to grow, and to find greater success. So, when you're trying to control everything for fear, fear of people failing,、um, it's this illusion of control everything, and you're going to to keep people from messing up and really failing.、Uh, once we get past that a little bit, and we actually recognize that failure actually is a part of growth. As we mess up, we learn, we grow, and we can continually reinforce the core culture, the core values of the organization,、uh, especially when those failures happen, because we can come back to it and have a conversation and debrief it, and and it becomes a learning opportunity. That's where we always need to be focusing our efforts. And when we micromanage, we rob our people of all of that opportunity for learning and for growth. Ultimately, they literally become automatons. They're just Carrying out, you know, the the protocol that we prescribe to them, and they're not learning, they're not growing, they're not bringing their authentic, creative self to the work that they do, and there's no meaning and purpose. You're going to have、um, higher turnover. People aren't going to be really bought into the the core mission and values of the organization. It, there just becomes a huge disconnect. So you got to let it go. I, I love the examples of of the workers that that kind of you know maybe slightly inappropriate with how they respond to、uh, you know, how they do the notes to the customers、uh, as they're trying to to delight the customers. But you know what is if you're prescriptive, yes, it's safe, but you're never getting that creativity. Once you let loose a little bit. It definitely opens up the opportunity for people to do things that you're not happy with, but it also opens up the opportunity for other people to surprise you and to do things you would never have thought of yourself. So the 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 downside of micromanaging is obvious, I think, when we can really step back and look at it. The upside of not micromanaging is you unleash the potential of your people. And so at this point in time, you might be thinking, okay, what is the real, real upside of not micromanaging? And it's this. I didn't do any of these projects. I didn't make the AGV. I didn't do the paint, rethink pink tax campaign. I didn't do any of this. But I'm standing here on a TED stage, taking all the credit for it.、Uh, yeah, you know, like this guy does nothing. He takes all the credit for it. He's a real CEO. This guy, he's really got it down, you know. But the reality is this: I don't have the CEO thing down 100%, Pat. But I've actually learned the most fundamentally challenging lesson I've ever. Had to learn, and that's this: there is only one solution to micromanagement, and that's to trust. Thank you. The solution to micromanagement is to trust. Absolutely, if you're going to let go of control, if you're going to empower your people, you have to trust. I get it. That can be really tough. That can be a hard thing,、um, and and you can you can do it over time though. You don't have to trust blindly. You don't have to unleash and unload everything and delegate everything to people that you have no trust or relationship with. You can build that trust over time, and that mutual accountability and trust will allow you to let go more and more, to micromanage less and less, to give up some of your power, to allow and to empower other people, and to really delegate and. Uh, to, to give them a chance to to do the work and and bring their unique insights and and innovation to work to the work that they do, ultimately it it comes back to trust. And when you trust, you unleash, you unlock the this potential of your team, of your employees. People are going to feel more invested. They're going to feel more bought in. They're going to feel more meaning and purpose.、Uh, they're going to feel、uh, more self driven, and and it just really creates a much better. Uh, atmosphere for everybody. So we need to learn to trust. We need to let go of control. We need to learn how to share power.、Uh, we need to let go of micromanagement. I, I'm sure everyone listening to this recognizes this. You know this. But take some a, a good hard look at how you lead your people and what micromanaging tendencies do you have, and how can you start to set those aside. 
I, I mean, I, I ultimately, we each just have to ask ourselves that question, and we have to uh, start taking steps to develop trust in our people. I know as we do that, that we we ourselves are going to find more fulfillment in the work that we do as leaders, because our, our job now becomes to develop the people around us, um, rather than to control the people around us. And it's certainly going to impact the experience at work of the people on our teams. I really love this TED Talk. I think there's so many good insights and lessons here. I hope you've enjoyed it. And as always, I hope you stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.